Hello, fabulous scholars. We have just finished The Widow's Tale in Canterbury Tales, and so now it's going to be a little bit more of the pilgrims talking as they're on their journey to Canterbury, and then, then we get to hear Chaucer's own poem in the competition. We'll see how he does compared to everybody else. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite story so far? All right, well, we'll see. Maybe Chaucer's poem will beat it. Maybe not. The partner and the summoner, with their arms around each other's shoulders, rolled along like two pirate ships lashed together in pitched battle. They roared songs into each other's ears like volleys of cannon fire, singing to whatever the miller was playing on his bagpipes. The summoner pausing only to cram garlic cloves into his mouth and chomp on them. So here's the partner and the summoner singing, and the miller playing his bagpipes. Seems like fun, if you like that kind of noise. The magistrate, that means a judge, perched forward like a parrot on a perch, trotted up to Harry with a fiercely efficient look on his face. Dinner, bed, he snapped. Any ideas? Horses, getting tired. I was thinking to spend the night at the Saracen's Head, said Harry affably, that means in a friendly way. We'll be there in half an hour. The magistrate altered the lengths of his stirrups, then busily altered them back again. Must be properly organized. Some very sloppy fellows here. That cook? <laughs> I'd throw him in jail. It's all in hand, said Harry. Before we get there, Geoffrey here, that means Chaucer, the author of this book, can tell us a story. Right, good. It's in hand then. Would organize it myself. Lots to do though. Lots on my mind. Yes, yes. All right then. And he bustled away to do something very important or at least think about doing it. I expect something good from you, Geoffrey, said my old friend. The ship's captain, tossed painfully about in his saddle, asked what work I did that made me good at storytelling. I'm a customs officer, really, I said. That means he keeps track of ships sailing into a harbor and how much money they need to pay for all the goods and things that they're bringing in to the city. Um, I'm also a, a poet in a small way. Oh, by St. Elmo, exclaimed the captain, a scribbling customs officer. <laughs> I fought pirates and thrown them to the sharks afterwards, but the only sharks that robbed me were your revenue men. Now well, we'll scuttle you now that we're on dry land. <laughs> you could tell me the thousand and one tales of the Arabian Nights and you still wouldn't get my vote, boyo. I knew now that I had to think of something a little special to entertain my fellow travelers. I won't give you a story at all, I exclaimed. I'll give you an epic poem in a hundred and seven verses. It's a little thing I composed last week. So now we're about to hear Chaucer's poem. A gem of a poem called Sir Topaz. It's about this guy right here, Sir Topaz. <clears throat> That's really in the book. <clears throat> now hark and listen to my song, the best you ever heard, about a knight who righted wrongs and who to glory spurred. His brave and fiery footed steed, this hero of great valor, did braver and more gallant deeds than any in Valhalla. <clears throat> this hero's name Sir Topas was, and in his armor bright, he quite outshone the sun because he also shone at night. His hair was gold as harvest wheat, his eyes as blue as sky, his legs, which ended at his feet, were shapely in the thigh. His trusty sword was polished, brighter than the moonshine's beam, and from his curly, hairy head reared up a helmet green. Not only was he very nice to look at quite close to, you never had to ask him twice for deeds of daring do. One night he lay upon his bed, his eyes were wide and starry. A dream had trickled through his head of such a lovely fairy. Fairy. <clears throat> I loved her in a twinkling too. 
he sighed into his mattress. And rising, stretching, blinking too, he stared out of the lattice. That means a fancy covering over the window. Tomorrow I shall find my love, he said unto the owls. Below the earth or up above, in fair land or in fowls. <clears throat> Fowl. He left at once upon his quest, his sword and shield in hand, and all day long he did his best to seek out fairyland. Of course he did eventually, but climbed through the door, came the most elementally grotesque, enormous poor. Paw, paw, a paw comes through. A giant guarded fairyland and would not let him in. I'm very sorry, Topaz said, I'll have to do you in. Oh, listen close and listen well. Oh, hear how Topaz fought. That oh so horrid giant fell. Oh, called Oliphant. Stop, stop, silence, not another word. Harry Bailey was leaning on the pommel of his saddle with a look of a seasick fisherman rearing up over the side of a rowing boat. His face was quite ashen. It means he's very pale and sick looking. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that last line. I said, but it was either that or um, change the name of the giant. And I don't like to change the facts of the story too much. My dear boy, Harry bellowed, if you had any feelings of pity at all in that merciless heart of yours, you would have stopped after the first verse. Spare us your appalling poem. I won't have another line of that intolerable nonsense inflicted on these poor defenseless people. You mean, you don't like it? I asked, hurt. Well, let's put it this way, said Harry. If you persist in the story of Sir Topaz, I shall feel obliged to take off your horse's saddle cloth and stuff it down your throat. Just then, the widow of Bath rode past me and inquired when I was going to begin. Harry told her I had changed my mind and was not going to tell a story after all, being too ignorant, that means not smart enough, to know any. I did not argue with him. When we reached the Saracen's Head, we found the door shut and the whole house apparently abandoned. That's the inn where they're planning to stay. Nobody seems to be there. Harry rattled the latch and the summoner brayed out, Let us in! I could eat the leg off a sheep with the wool still on it! The Franklin, that's like a butler, seemed shocked to find the inn shut. My master's doors are never shut to travelers. It's my job to make sure his larder is always full and his guests want for nothing. I keep a cold roast always on the kitchen table just in case people drop in. I tell you it snows food and drink when anyone visits my master. I could well believe the Franklin. He was that comfortable shape of man who enjoys good food but he was not gross, like the man who keeps the biggest helping to himself or leaves the larder bare for his friends. I envied the lord or gentleman whose house he ran. Open up, yelled the summoner, or I'll eat the straw in your stable and your horses after. Not good enough, really, lack of organization, muttered the magistrate, the judge. If a thing wants doing, better do it yourself. So here they are yelling at the hotel that is they want to stay at that's all locked up. You can see in the picture what's about to happen. Wait. So there's, there is somebody there. Okay. It's awfully thirst making all this riding, said the cook. His saddle had slipped around so that he was clinging to the side of his horse. There were wine stains into his hair. If I could just get down, I could roast a spit and build something. That's not right. I could build a roast and spit something. I could spit a build and... His horse shook itself and he slithered to a heap on the ground and made no further attempt to move. 
The summoner was bawling. Open the door or I'll excommunicate you, you heathen son of a benighted innkeeper. The miller was squaring up to the door with the clear intention of battering it down with his head. Then an upper shutter banged open and a pretty girl poked out her head. Paul's gone to Canterbury to pray for Auntie Marie, who's been taken poorly. The squire gripped my arm and gave a stifled exclamation. Did you ever see such eyes, Master Chaucer? Are you closed for business then? Called Harry. Well, Pa said not to open to the likes of him, said the innkeeper's daughter, pointing at the miller. But seeing as how there are men of the church among you, I'll be down and open the door. Such a sweet voice, said the squire, trembling visibly. With a shooting of bolts, the girl appeared in the doorway. We stumbled bow-legged into the inn, easing ourselves down on the benches. The girl busied herself fetching cheeses and ham, beer and loaves, fresh cream and apples, and she set two dozen eggs in the pot to boil. When the cook offered to help, she just propped him in a corner out of the way. <sighs> you are hospitality indeed, the squire told her admiringly. Oh, you're welcome, sir. It's a tasty enough snack, admitted the Franklin to me, but I wish I had you all at my master's house now. Oh, I would do you proud. There is no greater honor in this world than to sit with friends round your table while they eat your food. Next to the Franklin, the steward was crouched over his meal, his arms circling the trencher, that means like a plate, and his mole-like hands were shoveling food into his mouth. Nothing was going to go missing from his plate, so said the look in his shifty eyes. All right, everyone, satisfied? Barked the magistrate, standing up to inspect the room. He granted the meal his approval, dismissed the innkeeper's daughter, and sat down, somehow taking credit for the whole thing himself. There's the innkeeper's daughter bringing them food. Then the Franklin told his tale while we ate, he laid it before us like one of his renowned banquets, and we savored it all the more for being sat down at table. So scholars, tomorrow we will hear the Franklin's tale. Bye.